Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the fourth or fifth uh, My Virtual Jericho. Um, today, we've got uh, another Jericho resident. Jericho is, is full of full of professors. Uh, we've got Professor uh, James Naismith, uh, who is a, 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 bio, a biochemist at, at the University of Oxford. J Jim, first of all, who are you? So, uh, yeah, I'm Jim Naismith. I'm uh, director of the Rosalind Franklin Institute, and I'm also a professor of structural biology in Oxford. Uh, what's your background? So I, um, well, probably you can hear from my voice, I come from Scotland. Uh, I originally studied chemistry at Edinburgh, and then I went to Manchester for my PhD, and then America for a couple of years in Dallas. And then I came back to St. Andrews, and I was there until 2017. And then I moved down to Oxford to be, take a chair here and also to head up the Rosalind Franklin Institute. What does the Rosalind Franklin Institute do? So I brought some slides I can show in a moment, but Rosalind Franklin Institute is about trying to do uh, difficult technologies, drive new technologies to help uh, treat disease and find new cures and new medicines. So we're supposed to do things that are long-term, high-risk, that the UK needs, because we see most of the breakthroughs in medical science started in physical science. And so the idea is to try to bring physical science much closer to medicine, because I think if we're really going to shift how we discover medicines, we need new physical science. Now, I've got a sociology degree, so can you explain that uh, so that I understand it? <laughs> Please. Um, so I guess if we think about um, the structure of uh, proteins. So how do we understand how drugs work? That actually required some basic physics and chemistry. And although the output is really important for medicine, the real breakthrough came from people like Dorothy Hodgkin, who was here in Oxford, and others who really put their mind to physical science to answer these biological questions. And were named after Rosalind Franklin. And she did a very clever, but apparently to many of us simple, but it was really insightful physical experiment. She grew crystals of, um, of fibers of DNA, I should say. Now, people have been doing that for years, but she built a device that allowed her to control the humidity, so much in the same way you might control humidity in the greenhouse. But she designed that for a DNA fiber, and that was a real breakthrough. Once she had done that, then, and I might have a slide to show you, it transformed our understanding of what the structure of DNA was that led Watson and Crick to propose a model. So that physical science, the idea of doing a, sort of non-biological, not people touching, but just doing physics and chemistry to understand biology is really important. Do you want to show us your slide? Yeah, I've got some slides to show if that's okay. Fine. Just take me a second to show them. Okay, so first of all, you'll see an island, I think, you should see that. And then if I pop this up, you should see the Rosalind Franklin. So, let me uh, go to Rosalind Franklin first and I can come back. I was going to talk a little bit about coronavirus, but since we'll talk about Rosalind, I go to the end. I'll talk a little bit about Rosalind Franklin. So why are we called Rosalind Franklin? So this is her uh, story. So when we began the work of uh, DNA, people really didn't understood what it was. And so Rosalind Franklin, I'm going to just mark my pen. So, so we had a mixture of these two forms initially, and you got this messy, dreadful pattern. And what Rosalind Franklin was able to do was that she was able to get just this one, just B, and then this is the classic pattern here. And from that then, everybody was, we were able to solve the structure of Watson and Crick, we were able to solve the structure of DNA uh, using a model. So this is, really clever physical science experiment that she did. And there are things that we're doing now in other physical sciences, such as electron, using electrons, but also measuring things with very high power uh, magnets that are similar ideas about trying to see life, but see life at atomic detail. How long ago did you do this? So Rosalind Franklin's work was done in the 50s. Um, she had been a scientist in the coal board and then she had gone to France and then come back into London and done this work when she was there. And then, as I say, Watson and Crick saw that work and immediately made the leap forward. Now, your institute, did you set it up uh, three years ago? 
Yeah, so the funding came out from government uh, 2018. So I had a job on another institute in the campus and then we started the Rosalind Franklin. So we're building a building out at the campus. And for those of you who want to look at the building, we have a Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O uh, website and you can see the building going up at the Harwell campus. And, and, and so what sort of work do you do and how many, how many people do it with you? Uh, so my team uh, and colleagues, there are about uh, 20 of us at the moment, and the idea is that us, and we're adding chemistry. So there's a chemist called Ben Davis, who's joined us now, and he'll bring a large group with him. By the time we're fully operational, we expect to have about 200 people. Gosh, and, and, and finance entirely by government grants, EU grants in the past? So some of it will be grants from the government, others from charities such as the Wellcome Trust. And also we, we've had some money from industry uh, and partnerships with industry for these breakthroughs because of course they're keen to get their hands on them too. Is this stuff all cutting edge? Can you explain how it compares to other science? Yeah, so for instance, we're interested in looking at, um, we, we set ourselves a target, I should say, of factors of 10. So one of the things we can think about is being able to see inside the cell all the atoms. Now you can look at isolated components, so be, and that's what I trained in. So we'd be like finding out how a radio works by taking it into pieces and examining each piece at a time. What we're trying to do is build some technology that will allow us to look at the working cell, see everything all in one go. And that's this kind of dream of structural biology or medicine but it requires entirely new machines and new physics to do that. So that's an example of the cutting edge. It needs physicists, chemists, and biologists. We need to pick the right problem. And what's been your biggest breakthrough so far? In the Rosalind Franklin, uh, we've only, so I would think some of our work uh, in uh, discovering nanobodies that uh, block and bind to, sorry, nanobodies that bind to the spike protein of the coronavirus, it's something very recent and that's a team effort I always want to stress and my, my main job is to take the credit for all the people's hard work rather than do much myself. That's good, that's <laughs> why you're a professor. <laughs> yeah, that's right, there's a desk flyer and I fly the desks. Yeah. The, and then in my own lab career, probably some of the, the work we did in understanding how, um, how uh, sort of um, water gets through an oily layer without breaking oily layer. So if you think about bacteria, they have an oil shell around them. Essentially, it's an oil shell and there's water inside and water outside. They're able to get molecules through that oily layer without getting them damaged or touched oil. And they use these things called membrane proteins and we've studied a number of those. And these have been really, I think, important in understanding how bacteria do this really neat trick and also how you might poison bacteria because they have to do this. We don't do it in the same way. Let's move on, if we can, to coronavirus, you know, which is the, the virus that has changed the world. Um, can you explain to a simple, an audience simply how a coronavirus works and what it does? Yes, I've got just a few slides, if that might help. Sure. Uh, let me go back again. So apologies for everybody following online. This seems, I know I seem slow and clunky. Hopefully this isn't too bad. Okay, so this is coronavirus on... on let me get my pen again. So this is an electron micrograph and this is the virus here. And I'm going to zoom in and see this little bit here. This is called a spike. So this is the spike protein. And then I've used and I stole this from the web. I forget where I got this illustration, but here's a little spike here. So that's just the same here and here. So this is the real virus. It's got these little spikes on it. And this is a cartoon representation of the virus. So this is taken from this chap here. It's a very nice illustration. And so the virus binds to your human cell. Here's the spike protein. That's why that's important. This is inside your mouth or your nose or your throat. The virus spike protein binds to your uh, cell and then it enters inside the cell. Once it's inside the cell, it steals your protein machinery and makes lots of copies of itself. And so we're another interested in how you try to treat the disease. So you can think about blocking entry. 
So things that prevent the virus from binding to the cell in the first place. So that's where our nanobodies might come in. There are other scientists and particularly at Diamond and Oxford working on this. So the virus makes its proteins in an unusual way. If you think about cloth, if I was making a kilt, for example, I only need uh, 20 feet, but the virus actually makes 100 feet and then chops up the virus, chops up into 20 feet blocks. And so it needs a protein to do that chopping. And that's here. And so that's a protease and it, you can inhibit that and diamond at the synchrotron where I work in science it's not sort of made real progress here in trying to inhibit the virus. And then the virus has to copy itself and it does that through this RNA replication. And of course, that's another area that is potentially a really interesting thing. If we could stop any of these things, we'd stop the virus. And scientists in Oxford and elsewhere are working very hard on all three aspects of this. And just to say that, you know, we've had these viruses before. Uh, they belong to this family, most famously uh, started with SARS in 2013, and then MERS, which I guess not so many people maybe heard of. And of course, everybody has heard of this. And just to answer your question, why is it changing the world? It's changing the world because it gets big very, very fast. We don't really see this thing called exponential growth very often. So for example, March the 10th doesn't seem that long ago. This is roughly uh, uh, just about 20th of April. And this seems like, if you look at this, you think, well, nothing happened here. There are a thousand cases here but it's disappeared because in the last, it's always bigger at the end. So everything gets big very suddenly in exponentials. And I'm using the example from The Guardian that Charles Arthur tweeted. It's a nice way to show this, here's Wembley. If I imagine I had a sprinkler in Wembley and it dropped a drip in one minute and then two drips at minute two, four drips at minute three, eight drips at minute four and so on, right? Double, double, double you would fill the stadium by the first half, more, right, spill over the top of the whole stadium. That's how quick exponential growth goes. Is that a world figure you've got there or a British figure? Uh, that's the United States, actually. Right. Okay, so it physically works. It goes into your lungs and it, and it attaches itself to the cell and, and, and then replicates itself. Is, 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 that, is that a misunderstanding of it? No, that's right. And it, when it gets in the cells, it goes really fast um, and it copies itself uh, inside the body. So it makes lots and lots of copies uh, inside your cell. And eventually what happens is the cell kind of dies. So that's why you get sick. There's so many viruses inside the cell that kind of bursts out and the cell dies and you get sick. And then more viruses get into your bloodstream and more cells get infected. So is that how it stops you breathing by, by just taking over those cells? It stops you breathing for, there's complicated reasons behind that, you know, and I, I just want to stress I'm not a medical doctor. Um, the main re so some people die because they get inflammation in the lungs from the virus causes lung inflammation. Other people die for other reasons, uh, people with uh, heart disease and other problems. The virus doesn't just infect the lungs, but lungs is where you often see the symptoms and shortness of breath. There's a doctor in New York, isn't there, who says that coronavirus actually puts a, a yellow mucus inside the lungs and, and and that's probably not a bad thing you know that actually we're treating it in all the wrong way do you, do you know his work no i don't know his work um no so what's so, so, well, go on i'm gonna say it's a feature of fast moving uh, signs for there to be many claims that turn out not to be correct and um a lot of uh, some of the stuff that's brought to people's attention isn't peer review, isn't really tested. And so sometimes things that can be look interesting or promising turn out not to be. On this virus, you're working against time, aren't you really, all over the world? I mean, are you co cooperating yeah. with other scientists elsewhere? Yeah, this is a worldwide effort. So we're very fortunate to have uh, collaborations across the world, uh, China, the US, Europe, Everybody is working. Science has always been a team activity and we share our reagents and benefit from partnership with others. How will you know when, you, when you've got an answer? 
So that's a good question. So the answer I think will come in several stages. Uh, the ultimate answer is a vaccine and all of us have to hope that Professor Gilbert up in Oxford, her vaccine works or one of the other groups that are creating vaccines. Now, I'm very hopeful of that. I don't know exactly when it will arrive, but I'm confident we'll get a vaccine. In that case, it's over and we can stop. Between now and then, I think it's over when we can have some way to reduce the death rate in hospitals because people who get into hospitals are very seriously ill. Although it's a very small percentage of infected people, you know, it's still a significant number of people dying in hospitals from this infection. So some way to, in those treatments I sort of showed you, inhibiting either the virus getting in, stopping it making, it's cutting up its proteins into functional form or preventing it copying itself, something like that as a medicine to reduce the fatality in hospital could be, would be really, really important. And I feel confident that's coming. There's a lot of effort and I feel sure something is going to work. So trying to save lives is important. At the moment, one in three goes into hospital coronavirus uh, dies and, and one in two goes into intensive care dies. Is that, you know, that, that, that's remarkable, you know, horrible statistics, aren't they? Yeah, it's a very serious disease. I mean, I, I don't know, I don't think anybody who gets close to it, understands the science has never, has always believed it's a very serious illness. The, the trouble with that virus is that, as you correctly say, the small number of people who get seriously ill get dramatically ill. And yet it could be even half of the people infected don't even know they've infected. And at the moment, at the moment once you get into hospital, there's really nothing they can do apart from give you oxygen. Um, well, they can give you oxygen. There are other treatments they're trying to give people and they're doing tests. And of course, for some people, that's really important that the oxygen and the rest and being able to get, uh, you know, intravenous fluids, it just gives them time for their own bodies to fight the infection. But clearly, the best way to save lives is not to have people infected in the first place. Richard Peter last week is doing a, a big WHO study on using alternative drugs to treat, treat, treat uh, um, coronavirus. Are you aware of that? Anti-HIV anti drugs and so on. Yeah, so these are, there's a huge effort, um, not only by Sir Richard, but other groups around this repurposing of existing medicines to see if we can find ones that are safe to use and help treat the virus. Yes. Let's talk about the vaccine effort in Oxford. Are you involved in that at all? No, not directly, not at all. And how hopeful are you of that? And what, what, what will be the process and what will be the timescale on that? So the, the group in Oxford, uh, Professor Hill and Professor Gilbert are world leaders. Uh, they've had success with MERS, although it never reached the clinic, but they had promising data. They have now started safety trials and they, along with people around the world, are trying different approaches to try and defeat the virus. I'm confident one of them will work. Uh, I, Professor Gilbert's 80% certain she's going to work. Uh, she will know best of anyone. So, you know, I'm confident something will work. I think it's ambitious to be ready by September, but you know, it's good to be ambitious and we'll see. Um, who dares wins though in, in, in this vaccine? Is that right? Whoever gets there first will, will produce millions and millions and millions of doses, correct? Yeah, I think that would be the plan. The, the world needs it. I mean, bad as it is here in, in, in Europe, the virus has had a terrible toll here. Uh, most scientists I think are horrified at the toll it will exact in countries that can't afford or are unable to lock down as a means of isolation and spread. So when it reaches poorer countries with large populations, I think most of us are quite scared about what that will do. Let's talk so about numbers. Uh, there's a great debate in Britain about how many people exactly have died. It's, it's a morbid debate. But what, what, what do you think? So I agree with you. I think it's a... Uh, it's a point, almost a pointless debate. It's not a national scorecard, it's grisly. Um, you know, it's no, le it's no more or less a tragedy if a f it, that people die in France or Italy or die in the UK. What is true is that South Korea stands out as an example of a country with a much lower death rate. And clearly the UK has to learn from South Korea what has worked. Germany also has a much lower death rate uh, now, whether when we get to the final counting, 
there is much of a difference between France, Italy, Spain, and the UK. My, I don't think it's really going to be that important in the scheme of things to get, you know, I don't think there are huge lessons to be drawn from those except the simple truth that had the UK imposed social distancing a week before or 10 days before it did, you would have reduced the toll by a factor of 10. That's just the way the virus spreads. So rather than 20,000, it would be 2,000. If everything shifted by 10 days. So it's not clear that the soft, dis the soft distancing measures may have had some effect. So I'm talking about shifting everything by 10 days, not just a hard lockdown. So the death rate appeared to plateau in part due to soft, dis soft distancing measures, you know, where they started to discourage people. And there's evidence that hand washing and other hygiene methods had started to reduce the viral spread too. But if everything was shifted by 10 days, that's roughly correct. You would have expected about 10 times less. So but the important the thing is around about the 12th of March, say, then we would actually be looking at far fewer deaths than we've got. Yes, but I emphasize that everything, all the soft distancing measures and the hand washing campaign all had an effect too. So they all have to shift earlier. And this is the problem with hindsight. It's very difficult to convince, you know, we live in a democracy, people have to accept these measures. And, you know, I, I, I'm glad I didn't have to make the decisions. It's easy for me to stand up and say what's true now, uh, that 10 days earlier would have been made a huge difference. That's probably why Germany has done better because Germany had a, may have had a better idea of the total number of infections because it had a wider testing program and was able to realize how widespread the virus was. I don't think we really understood how widespread it was till now, till, you know, and once we locked down, the virus had to burn its way through. It was clearly in London. WHO said in early March, testing, testing, testing. Perhaps should we have listened to it? Well, so the, it's true, but it's also more complicated than that. That it can't be South Korean model clearly successful it can and it's arrogant to assume that we could have created that overnight south korea has worked very hard to build its model uh, of track test track, track test isolate it's not something that can be done overnight we didn't have the infrastructure i'm glad i didn't have to make the calls uh, i've you know i'm, I'm not going to criticize we're on the titanic the most important thing is to get as many of us off it as safely as possible we can leave the inquiries till we're all safely off. Uh, I don't think it helps. The most shouting that we should have had more lifeboats. We are where we are. We have to get as many people out of this as possible. Are you on stage? No, no, no. Not, not, no. Not, not, not. It, no, I did I, I didn't apply for stage. I applied for a year. I, last year I was asked to uh, put in my name for the uh, another government science team. I get rejected with an interview. So there you go. All right. So if you had been on stage, what, what would you have been advising in early March? Uh, I wouldn't be on stage because I don't have the expertise that's really critical to this. Uh, SAGE, the members of SAGE have real expertise in epidemiology, uh, virology, public health, logistics. These are areas which I'm not an expert in. My own expertise is in structural biology and molecular biology. That's not where SAGE needs advice at population level. But you, you applied for the, 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 the other committee, which is called, remind me, SINVAR. It was called it was the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology or something. Anyway, that was, uh, they, they advertise for uh, people, you don't get paid for these things, yeah. but they advertise for people in October and I got binned out with it in an interview. So there, tells you all you need to know. <laughs> no, uh, no, no exit strategies, how are we going to get out of this? We are going to get out of it. And I feel hopeful that the testing program is going to get ironed out. It looks to me that that's starting to deliver. We need to get the tracking sorted out. And I think there are hopeful signs that we will do. And the important thing is, and I always stress this, it's no use having plans that people won't stick to. So there's no point in having some big plan that people say, I'm not going to do that. So we need the public to support tracking. And that does mean giving up some privacy. And, you know, obviously you want to minimize that loss of privacy in a democracy. And, you know, for those of you who might be conducting illicit affairs, 
you don't really want that to be publicized to your intimate partner, right? Um, you know, people have to have a private life. Everybody has secrets. So, but tracking is really important. You have to find contacts and quickly. So that's going to need technology and a level of surveillance that really we're all often not comfortable with. And then the final thing will be isolation. So when we find people, particularly people who aren't ill, we need some way to help them isolate. And so that needs some thought as to whether we provide we say, if you live in your own, that's probably fine. How do we make sure you're warm fed? Because if we don't have, if we incentivize you to go out and shop because you've got no food, then we're not really isolating. So that needs some thought. And of course, if you're in a big house with other people, then we need to think how that's going to be managed. So the, there's some effort needs to go in, I think, to isolation too. And that, finally, yes. we're not going to go back to where we were. So social distancing of some form, what I would call the soft measures will be in place for a while. But I feel hopeful that we can get there before we face any second wave. You surprised how pliant people have been in terms of the lockdown? Uh, I think what's missed here is just how good young people have been. Because it's really them that are taking one for the team here. Fat old men like me, you know, are the most vulnerable to the virus. And, you know, we're asking young, healthy people to give up their love life, social life, work life for a period of time. We're asking them to put all that in pause to save us, and they have largely done so. And so I think there's not, you know, the, the newspapers are always full of beating up on young people for this, that, and the next thing. But really their sacrifice here, their willingness to put their lives on hold for us, I think has been something really commendable that isn't talked about enough. Is there, is there a limit? Do you think people are losing their patience? I mean, Jericho is a bit busier today than it has been in a few days. We know that there's going to be a limit. We don't know what that limit is. And, and again, I think that's going to take social scientists. So you asked where, you know, we talked a little bit about backgrounds. That needs people who study how people respond to incentives and pressures, because a plan isn't a plan if it doesn't apply to the real world. If we assumes humans are different than they are, it's not going to work. So a, a, usual, a usual rule of thumb is that it has to assume human nature won't change. So I think there needs to be thought how long this can go on and, and that will need experts of a different sort. What's your hunch? If you were advising Boris on, on lockdown, when would you say is the sort of end date? Uh, that is outside my... Outside my um, expertise to give him that answer well, all i would say is that from a science point of view the what he needs in place to manage track trace isolate would be testing capability rapid means to isolate and if rapid means to trace contacts and that really means essentially if for instance i was diagnosed on tuesday we really want to get all my contacts traced by wednesday and then get them tested and isolated if necessary and the most important people to isolate will be those with no symptoms. So it's, it's manpower uh, as well as willpower, is it needed for this? It needs organization and it needs resources and organization. That's what the, the government are putting towards that in the moment. Uh, I don't think it can come quick enough, but we also have to worry about the care home situation. I think that's another area where you know, there's some, some uh, concern about that situation. Now, you're a Scot. Have you been impressed with how um, Nicola Sturgeon has, uh, has conducted herself for the last four to six weeks? You know, I don't watch so much Scottish TV now down here. They don't have it on. Um, from what I see of her, she's followed, uh, and to be fair, so largely has the UK government. What it perceives, it's taken scientific advice and made the decisions for which it's accountable. Politicians decide, not scientists. And she seems to have followed the same line. So, you know, I guess the proof of the pudding will be the people who vote for her in Scotland if they think she's done a good job. Certainly in the few occasions I've heard her speak, she seems to be, you know, following sensible advice and giving people clear messages. But I would say largely that's true down in the UK and England here too. They, they, I think there is an issue with political journalists asking questions rather than science journalists, but that's for maybe for another time. Because they don't know. Is that why? Yeah, well, so one of the problems is that, yeah, science doesn't know and there are finely balanced decisions and you might change your mind from day to day. I mean, 
as a scientist, I can tell you almost all my ideas, in fact, 99% of them are always wrong. That's why I do experiments. I do experiments to prove my own ideas wrong, and I'm usually successful in that, that most of my ideas are rubbish. It's the data that tell us really what's happening. And so you might have an idea how something's happening, seems sensible on Tuesday, new data comes on Wednesday, and by Thursday, you're 180 degrees turned around. Now, in a political world, that's called a U-turn. In the science world, that's learning. And what would terrify me is if the fear of journalists meant politicians wouldn't change their mind when the science changes. Yeah, and I think that's the point. I think the public understand that completely because that's how we live our own lives, right? We understand, though, this has changed. I'm not going to do that anymore. But the gotcha sort of political journalism that is deployed here isn't helping that. But I mean, the government's been saying from the beginning, follow the science, follow the science. Now, what does that mean? You know, they follow the science in one direction and change direction. What, what's well, if science change. Yeah, I mean, that's the way science goes. We're learning an awful lot about this. This isn't like gravity, you know, we, we've known about it for a long time. Science will change its mind about this virus. Um, and you mentioned this doctor in the US who I come across work, but science will change its mind and there'll be different calculations and different insights. And we may have to change direction very quickly. And, you know, my concern is that we don't change direction. My concern is that we should change direction as soon as it makes sense to do so, not to hang on to safe face. So herd immunity was uh, the name of the game for about four or five days when Dominic Cummings fell in love with it and then that changed. So my question again is which science are you following? You know, you're following di different, different scientists, you know, does, does, does Sir Patrick, what's the name, have all wisdom? No, I mean, they have a committee where I would imagine, so most of the people that I've seen the names of are anything but blushing violets. And they will have their strong views and make them very clear. And ultimately, there'll be a consensus, and that is the advice given to government. I think it's appropriate that government listens to the breadth of that advice. It doesn't just filter it. It, it understands there are debates and differences, but ultimately, you have to give the politicians some advice. I would add that herd immunity is something that really comes from the vaccine world and the, that it is being played in the popular press in a different way. I don't think anybody really, I've never seen a scientist say what we should do is just let the virus rip through the population and, and hope for the best. I've never heard that said by uh, Valence or Witte and I've never heard any other UK scientist say, yeah, this is, this is what we should do, get as many people infected as possible. I've never heard said, I think it's unfortunate that that's become such a prominent thing. I think Dominic Cummings did once say privately that you know, let it rip through the community and we'll lose a few, few old age pensioners, you know. That, 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 well, I hadn't heard him say that. So, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I certainly haven't heard a scientist say that. No, because, uh, because I, I, I can see the way the wind is blowing. The scientists are going to take it in the neck at, when, in any public inquiry, aren't they? The politicians will, 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 will not. I mean, I think scientists have to sign. Scientists will have to own up to their mistakes, where the mistakes have been made. And, but I would say that it's been an extraordinary time. I wouldn't like to second guess. So my view is that the most useful thing from any inquiry will be to learn to do better next time. If the inquiry devolves into, uh, you know, finding the guilty and punishing them then you can guarantee nobody will sit in those committees again from the science world, and then politicians will be in their own. And that would be really bad. I mean, I think where scientists have been careless or reckless, that's one thing where they have had the wrong guess or hypothesis that was subsequently proven to be wrong, that's a different thing. And we have, we have to be, and I'm sure the public are grown up enough to understand the difference between those two. I suspect the errors will be in the latter category that what we thought would be true or guess might be true was proven wrong. If a sign where scientists recognized that as soon as they could and change their advice, that's exactly what they should do. But if we simply have a, you know, a, a show trial, you'll never get scientists to come back into government and help again. A couple of questions have come in about, about the app, the app which is the Department of Health is developing. Should that go out to tender? Is that, is that gonna work? I have absolutely no idea. I can't help you on that one. Okay. What was? Sorry. Sorry. Go on. 
Should sport I, return in July? Is it sensible for sport to return in July? That's another question. It depends what you mean by sport. So if you mean closed doors footballing, theory, that may be possible depending on our ability to test. I would be surprised if we will see crowds of people in the stadium in July in the same way that we might have done before. So I think that's unlikely. Now, you, you mentioned earlier on that social distancing will have to continue in some shape or form. So look forward to say October. Will we two, two meters apart? What, what else? All have masks on? Uh, masks is a particularly fraught issue. The kind of masks that most of us can get access to don't protect us, they protect others from us. And there's, you know, it's a lively debate as to how many lives that might save. Let's see. So I think what will be the case is that, you know, things like uh, large assemblies in sports stadiums or rock concerts probably won't restart by October. I'd be surprised if we're able to do that. I think we'll have some form of more normal life by October, but it will depend on our ability to track, trace, isolate, and crucially, and I'm very hopeful that there'll be medicines to lessen the fatalities in hospital. So that will, I think, if those things are there, I think we'll see, you know, a much more, a more relaxed uh, social distancing, but I can't imagine we'll go back to days of, you know, 60,000 in Wembley, for example, by October. I just think that seems well, unlikely. Not before next year, do you think? Not before 2021? Possibly not before we have a vaccine or a very effective medicine, of course. We, we're talking about medicines. I'm confident it'll work, but I'm also being uh, cautious in my optimism in that I think I'm certain we will have medicines that will be able to be given to people who are seriously ill and save many of their lives. We could be all lucky, right, and get optimistic where the drug is so good, so effective that we could give it to everyone who develops any symptoms at all. And in that case, we can go back to normal living. So it is, you know, there's a lot of things can happen between now and then. For instance, if Richard Petto discovers that some drug which is cheap as chips and safe can be given to everyone and it's clinically validated through trials, then we're, we're out of this, right? You know, we're done. If you were a health dictator, would you test everybody in the country? I mean, we're talking about 25 million at the moment, aren't we? No, I think you have to, at the moment with the, resources we have, you have to put the resources to where they're the most good. So waste using, putting, over investing in the worried well isn't a good use of resources. So being able to track people and test effectively is more important than being able to test everybody in my opinion, because if you're testing everybody, you're not doing something else. And so that, that I'm, I'm more worried about care homes and the elderly where we could put resources there than have, trying to create some fantastical 25 million testing capability. So would you test everybody in the care home, the staff and, 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 patient, and residents? I don't know about residents, but I certainly think we should be moving towards some form of what we would call sentinel testing. So that would be testing uh, people at random who work in care homes. Um, to make sure that, you know, the, it's the asymptomatic ones, I always come back to this, it's where you don't have any symptoms and you don't know you're infected. Those are the ones where we, if we can isolate them, will make a huge difference to the disease. So some form of watching, trying to help people do the right thing in care homes, I think is important in a random way. The reason is that lockdown measures don't have the same impact in care home. Elderly people are rarely out in uh, rock concerts in big crowds. So they tend to be, once the virus gets in the home, it will spread within the home. So the key thing is to keep the virus out of the home. They go to Andre Ray concerts instead. But <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but I, I, I don't mean to be flippant. To help people stay at home, we need to support them to stay at home. We need to make it easy, provide entertainment, ways for them to engage with families and to make sure that we try to keep them as safe as possible. I mean, it's probably not your field, but how is this going to affect the mental health of the nation, do you think, lockdown? It's not my field. I'm not a medical, mental health expert. Clearly, it's very stressful for many people. Uh, my own parents are, uh, my father will be 80 this year. Uh, my mother's in her 70s. And, you know, they do miss seeing their great-grandchildren, their grandchildren. It's very hard on them.
Let's talk about Oxford. Oxford seems to be the centre of an awful lot of world coronavirus research, you know, med medical, biological, um, and social. Why is that? There's a lot of clever people here. I may start with the students. Um, you know, Oxford has always been one of the world's leading research universities, and you just see that it has been able to turn its attention here. It's one of the arguments for having world-class sort of research-based universities is that these pandemic came out of nowhere. We couldn't recreate Oxford. Right? So we're lucky we've got it. So are you proud of the way your university has been performing in the last three, three or four months? Uh, I'm astounded at the commitment of some of the students and staff who are doing this work. I mean, you know, I work long hours, but the people in the lab, some of them are working incredible hours to try and make a, you know, stuff that will actually have an impact in the next couple of months on people. And so, you know, I think we should all be proud of the hard work they're doing. And I don't mean to say that they're somehow above doctors or nurses or people in NHS or care homes, but some of these people in science are making a huge contribution to it. Now your staff are all working remotely, are they? You have closed the lab down. No, my, some of my team, uh, the Franklin, are working in the lab actually at the moment. So they wear masks when they're in the lab, uh, they wash their hands in homemade alcohol uh, sanitizers, they keep apart by two meters, uh, but they're working in the lab. So the work continues? Yes, absolutely, because that work is about these nanobodies to help defeat the virus. And we are hopeful, but obviously the data will tell us that these nanobodies could be useful to treat the virus. And your time scale for that, any idea when you'll get some provable results? Probably in a month, we'll know whether they are effective in, in the lab, so to speak. And then beyond that, it will be for others to decide whether to take them into clinical trials. And there's a, you would have to go through an animal stage and then into humans. And of course, you know, other people need to, to take that on. But we would hope to have promising lab results or at least tie down the lab results in about a month. The important well, thing you, is to say, sorry. Early June, and how long the clinical trials and so on uh, take you to the end of the year or beyond? No, we would hope that if, if it gets prioritised, and of course it will depend on the options before the people who make these decisions. It's not that they can try everything, they'll have to make a decision. But these trials could be done within quite a short time period. There may be an issue that we may not have enough sick people by then in the UK. Maybe other countries may have to be doing these trials. I think you might have heard uh, the people from the vaccine also talk about that, that we may have to vaccinate other countries because the UK may have suppressed the virus so much. Uh, yes, yeah, so Richard, Richard, Richard Peter was saying much the same, actually, that, you know, it, it, we might be too effective. And then, but, so the population to experiment on it has got smaller. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. And obviously, we'd rather that was the case. Now, um, uh, let, let's talk about slightly more pleasant things. You're a Jericho resident. Um, what is it you like about Jericho? Um, lots of things, actually. So I used to live in the country. Uh, but St Andrews is almost all the country, right? So we live in a village called Strathkinnis. And that, the one thing I did, I really loved about Strathkinnis was it was great to bring up the kids. We could walk up to the top of the hill in the village school and we went and I could drop the kids off at five to nine, got on my bike and I was in work by about one minute past nine. So it was nice. Um, here is very different. We're in the heart of something. Our children are grown up. So we enjoy the cinema. So we're regulars or were at the Phoenix. Obviously, we like the restaurants. I like being able to walk into town and hardly ever drive, uh, something I always hated. So, you know, I really like that part of it. And there's a community in Jericho that's quite interesting and diverse, which is nice too. So, how well you get, you get the science bus every day, do you? I uh, know. I take my bike over the bridge opposite. So, we live just near the piazza, or what we call the piazza, the, the, on Mount Street. So, we cross over the bridge. And uh, then cycle down, I cycle down the path into the station, get the one minute to eight train every day, get off the train, cycle up from Harwell up to some did cut up to the Harwell lab and start work at 20 to nine, like clockwork. Let's talk about the piazza now. That's, that's a, a project that is being developed in front of your very eyes, isn't it, as we speak? Yes, indeed. And, uh, and Often, as I hear when I'm on video conferences, I can hear them drilling away and battering away. Not today. You know, can you yeah, uh, no, they were, out, they were out earlier. They've stopped now. 
they've put a they put a workers' loo in there. I see in a workers' changing position, and everything else. Yeah, and so the cabin on the. Is that going to become the trendy corner of Jericho once you have uh, York Stone? <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, I, I we'll see what they leave it with. I think. Uh, okay, I mean, probably a final question for me. So, what what's your message to ordinary people about coronavirus and 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 where it's going to leave us and take us? Uh, it will end, and we will. And the important thing is pro, from the so several things. One is we have to learn to do better next time. There will be a next time, so you know to learn the right lessons. Second is to remember the role that young people played here in willingness to, to isolate themselves and put their lives in pause and I think you know that when we come back maybe we'll not be quite so complacent about science and and this view that uh, it's an optional extra in society you know we've had enough of experts kind of stuff I think science you know people have turned to science I think it has tried its best to answer it but it's not a foolproof thing and I think people are seeing science at re in real time in a way most people have never seen before so my hope is that leads to an appreciation of its importance because it will be important to get us out of the next one. Is this the greatest public health uh, uh, crisis in, in your lifetime? Comfortably, I would think. You know, my, our generation saw the, the biggest financial crash since uh, the 20s and 30s. We've seen the biggest political turmoil. I lived through two referendums, of course, Scottish independence and Brexit. And now we're in the biggest public health crisis. So yeah, it's been a fairly eventful sort of past 12, 15 years. And of course, we also had multiple wars at the turn of the century too. So it's been a busy 20 odd years. A very light question. You, know, you worked with Louise Richardson up at St. Andrews and she came around to dinner one night, didn't you? Uh, yes, yes. I have inside information, you see. Did you uh, like Jericho? Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I mean, I have a lot of time for uh, Louise Richardson. I said that she's she was a good she was a good boss in St Andrews, um, and I think she's been a good leader for Oxford too. She re the house was a bit of a mess when she came round because we'd we were having the building work done. So, but uh, yeah, she she was very nice when she came round. I'm sure I'm sure she understood. Um, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, um, um, and see see you in the real world soon. And yes, indeed. See you everybody soon. Yeah. Just say next week we've got Tim Boswell from BBC Radio Oxford. Um, put your questions to, to him about uh, what the BBC is doing or should be doing in the crisis and afterwards and whether the BBC is in peril. The week after that, in his spy, talking about life uh, in, working for Oxfam and others in the third world. And the week after that, hopefully, a, a session called Imagine Jericho, where people just spend three, four minutes imagining what they'd like Jericho to be. Um, do join us for that and thank you all for watching. Cheers.